Hey everyone, welcome to our second in a series of EOC review videos. These videos are meant to help students review content and preparation for the end of course exam in biology in the state of North Carolina, but they can be used as a refresher for lots of basic biology topics. And go ahead and subscribe if you find this kind of material helpful for your biology review. In this video, we're going to be talking about ecosystems, which is about 18 to 22 percent of the biology end of course exam in North Carolina. We'll cover essential standards 2.1 and 2.2, as well as their objectives, which include topics like nutrient and energy cycles, adaptations, ecological relationships, and ecosystem changes, as well as human impact on the environment and human resource use. But keep in mind, this video is meant as review, so we don't have time to touch on everything, just the simplified essential. So we'll get a deeper look at photosynthesis and cellular respiration in later review videos. Today we're going to look at the flow of energy and cycling of matter, uh, such as water, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen through ecosystems, and that's an important part of this section. Each of these cycles is important to maintaining the health and sustainability of an ecosystem. So this diagram is similar to one you might see on the exam. In this diagram, we have uh, a light source here. We have some water in this terrarium. We have some plants here. We have some water vapor bubbles here, and we have some snails. And so if we're looking at this particular ecosystem, we can analyze it in various ways. Um, if we're talking about the exchange of carbon, carbon dioxide or CO2 is the carbon compound that's exchanged between the plants and their environment. So the plants are taking in carbon dioxide in the process of photosynthesis, and the snails are giving that off in the process of cellular respiration. Remember, plants also are going to do cellular respiration as well, and that's how they get their ATP energy for all the cellular processes that they're going to do. Now, plants use carbon from the atmosphere to create glucose and oxygen, which, if you remember, are the ingredients for cellular respiration. Now, you might be asked a question like, if more snails are added to this ecosystem, what effect would it have on the plants in the container? Now, one of the most basic answers is maybe the snails would eat more plants, <laughs> and that could be an answer choice. Um, but there could also be, theoretically, increased carbon dioxide because there's more snails performing more cellular respiration. They're giving that carbon dioxide off into the environment, and then the plants are going to take in that carbon dioxide and we could see increased plant growth. So you might want to think about that when you're analyzing these types of problems. We're going to talk about trophic levels and this is a way to look at different ecosystems and the energy cycling through them. At the very bottom level of a trophic pyramid we have our producers and these are organisms that are going to be taking energy from the sun, they are autotrophic, and they have the most efficient access to energy. After that we have our primary consumers. These are organisms that are going to be heterotrophic and are going to consume our producers. After that, we have secondary consumers. They're consuming the primary consumers. And then we might even have tertiary consumers at the very top of this pyramid. What's important to recognize is ultimately the source of all energy on Earth is from the sun. And that sun, via photosynthetic processes, is going to help us get the glucose we need at the producer level. Now, after that, energy is lost at each level you go up in this trophic pyramid. About 90% of the energy is lost as heat or other processes that are going to be wasting energy. Now, because it's not very efficient to go up in trophic levels, you might be asked where is the highest amount of energy within a system like this, and you would say down here at the producer's level. The least amount of energy would be at the top here with our tertiary consumers because we're losing a great chunk of energy each time we go up a level. Now, you should also be able to recognize and know the different steps of things like the water cycle, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, and the oxygen cycle. And the nitrogen cycle is important for many molecules in our bodies, and it's often one of the least touched on cycles in biology classrooms. So be sure you review the steps of the nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen makes up almost 80% of our atmosphere, so it's a really huge component of our atmosphere. And there are nitrogen fixing bacteria that help us get the nitrogen into the forms needed for other organisms to make proteins and DNA. Remember, DNA is made of nitrogenous bases with nitrogen, and amino acids use nitrogen too. So really essential for a lot of parts of living systems. So let's talk about different strategies and adaptations organisms have to survive. A heterotrophic organism is an organism that must consume other organic compounds for food. So for example, we are heterotrophs. We are able to obtain nutrients by consuming other organisms or their products. Now there's also autotrophs, which are organisms that are able to form their own organic molecules for food. And they do that through processes like photosynthesis, where plants are gonna be producing glucose from those other uh, gases. Now, 
One of our goals in biology is to analyze the survival and reproductive success of organisms in terms of behavioral, structural, and reproductive adaptations. And remember, adaptations are going to aid in the survival of organisms. We'll talk more about adaptations when we get to evolution, but for right now, just keep in mind that each of these differences most likely resulted from adaptations in response to environmental factors or environmental changes. So some behavioral adaptations you might need to be aware of are things like migration, hibernation, imprinting, learning. Structural adaptations could be things like nutrition, respiration, transport exc excretion mechanisms, or even camouflage. And then reproductive adaptations could be things like sexual versus asexual reproduction, using eggs or seeds or spores having a placenta or different types of fertilization. So let's take a look at some of these adaptations with respect to plants. The differences in different plant species most likely resulted from adaptations in re response to different environmental factors. Um, and remember, these adaptations are aiding in their survival. So things like stomata, these are little openings that are gonna provide passages for gas exchange in plants surrounded by two guard cells. Stomata can look differently depending on the different plant and that is an adaptation. Sometimes we have fewer stomata in environments that are more dry or arid and that helps prevent water loss in the plant. Now vascular tissue is an interesting one. This is the xylem and phloem of a plant and early plants like mosses, which we see here, don't have vascular tissue. Um, and so this is an adaptation that came later on with things like ferns and gymnosperms and angiosperms. And speaking of angiosperms, flowers are a reproductive adaptation that a lot of plants have. Organisms can interact with each other in various ways. Mutualism, for example, is a type of behavior where both organisms are gonna benefit. So you might think of uh, things like a bee and a flower. Both are getting advantages here. The bee is being able to get the pollen in order to create the honey it needs. The flower is helped with its reproduction by the distribution of pollen. Another type of symbiotic relationship is parasitism. This is where one organism benefits and the other is hurt or harmed. Mosquitoes, and of course, the protus malaria is a parasite as well. Commensalism is a type of relationship where we have one organism benefiting and the, neither, the other is neither hurt nor harmed. And these are things like barnacles that attach to a whale. Now, there's also predator-prey relationships, which can be very dynamic and predator-prey populations can fluctuate depending on what's happening within the ecosystem. In terms of communication and behavior, a few terms you might want to know. Imprinting is when a young animal learns something specific in a particular period of time. Territoriality is where there is a protection of a habitat or territory with tactics such as aggressive behavior, songs, pheromones. Conditioning is a process that leads to learning, and we have both classical and operant conditioning. And habituation is going to be when an organism is going to show a decreased response to a stimulus over time. And ecosystems can be relatively stable over hundreds or thousands of years, even though populations within the ecosystem may fluctuate depending on certain factors. So being able to recognize a graph for carrying capacity will be pretty important. Uh, you can recognize this graph, so you might be shown a graph with a similar shape and see that as the population increases, all of a sudden it kind of hits this point where there's small fluctuations, but it's relatively stable over a period of time. And we know from here that there's probably some limit to this population's growth at that period of time, such as uh, food, water, space, or sunlight. And so we, if we were to see a graph like this, we should be able to recognize that environments have limited resources and this particular population has hit the limits for one of those resources in its environment. Now, if I were to see this graph, I, without being told that there was a disease introduced into the environment, I should be able to guess that what happened to this population? Since there's such a sharp decline right here, I could probably guess there's a disease or an introduction of a very uh, successful predator. And so again, we should be able to recognize certain events happening with just the shapes of these population graphs. Now getting into human impact, this is a large topic that is going to show up in many questions on the EOC, so you should be familiar with different things that humans have done that can impact the environment in different ways. One of which, like we see here with the kudzu, is the introduction of invasive species and how that can actually be harmful to local native organisms. Invasive species are going to do harm to an environment and often outcompete or destroy the habitats of native organisms. Human, human pollution is another big issue, but there are many other human activities that can impact the environment. These include population growth, pollution, other waste, global warming, burning of fossil fuels, habitat destruction, and the introduction of non-native species. I have a whole video on this, which I'll link below. It'll be helpful to watch if you need a refresher. Remember, 
as the human population continues to grow, there will be a more rapid depletion of natural resources. And habitat destruction is the number one reason organisms are going to go extinct or become endangered. So, you know, like I said, there are many different examples of human impact on the environment, and we're going to talk about a few of these in this video, but it's important to go back and review them because there are several questions that will probably pop up about human impact on the EOC exam. Um, an important one to know right now, what has contributed most to the overall warming of the Earth's atmosphere, you should be able to recognize that as the burning of fossil fuels. So here's some other types of human impact. Global climate change or global warming. Habitat destruction fragmentation. Remember, this is a huge one. This includes things like deforestation, urbanization. Agriculture is a big one. This could also fit in habitat destruction, but also things like runoff, or the water use involved with agriculture is a huge human impact to other local ecosystems. Monocropping is when we have one particular crop used over a period of years and it's not switched out and the nutrients are depleted from the ecosystem. And then of course the introduction of invasive species or the introduction of disease and waste are big ones. All right, I wanna talk a little bit about the difference between global warming and the depletion of the ozone layer because these are two separate things with two separate effects and two separate causes. And a lot of times students get these confused. So global warming is caused by the combustion or the burning of fossil fuels, and it causes the, warmings of, the warming of Earth's atmosphere. It can lead to increased global temperatures, extreme conditions, loss of habitats, sea level rise, many other things. The ozone layer, on the other hand, is caused specifically by the use of CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, or halocarbons, and the holes that are going to be created because of those chemicals can cause increased UVA radiation, eye damage, and skin cancer. But the ozone layer being depleted is not the major cause of global warming, and global warming really doesn't have to do much with the depletion of the ozone layer, so please make sure you keep those two ideas separate. All right, that was a very quick review of ecosystems and some of the topics that might show up on the Biology EOC in North Carolina. Stay tuned for further videos and thanks for watching.